Father, we thank you for your holy word and the ways in which you choose to reveal yourself, Lord, to us. We thank you that even through songs that have been written, Lord, you reveal yourself and your truth through prayers that are prayed, through simple little actions that are done out of love to others. And Lord, we thank you that primarily you reveal yourself through your word. And that's why we enter into this time and I pray your blessing on it. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give me the words to speak, to just clearly communicate the message of the cross, why we're here, Lord, and what you have done for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be changed in a combination of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Throughout these next three days, may we be changed more and more into your likeness and to live the new life you purchased for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I think it's interesting if you ever go on a road trip or a flight of some sort that you know your destination, you know your goal, unless you're my wife who loves to jump in the car and just drive somewhere and then we'll decide on the way. She's got that spontaneity to her, but most of us like to know the destination. And I would argue that just going through life and just trying to figure it out and not really focusing on where you're going is not the right way to do it. And so tonight, we're embarking on a journey together. And it's important to understand the goal in mind. And the goal really is, and this really last Sunday, Palm Sunday, combined with Good Friday service and Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, this next you know, two days from now, they all combine together in the hopes that you and I would be different, that we'd be changed in the ways that God would have us to be changed, that we would be new in Christ. Whether you, wherever you're at in your faith, whether you've known Christ for a long time, or you're just now hearing about the message of Christ and the cross and the empty tomb, either way, there's going to be something for all of us in these next three days. In order to really understand the cross, there's a lot of different places I could have gone. But we really need to look at the last six days of Jesus' earthly ministry. We touched on it last Sunday. So if you were here, you're ahead of the game. You've got a good idea of where we're going and where we've been. But I want to look at, in this opening part, looking at each of the six days and what happened. Because as we covered last week, Jesus went from everybody loving him to everybody hating him in six days' time. Now, you and I might be pretty good at turning people against us. That was a big turnaround. Six days when the whole nation loves you and then all of a sudden the whole nation is crying out, crucify him. And yet he did nothing wrong. That's the kicker. So day one, we saw that was the triumphal entry we studied last week where Jesus, to fulfill the scriptures, rode into Jerusalem on the back of a young donkey, not a wild stallion, this warrior horse, but a humble wild young donkey that's never been ridden. He goes into Jerusalem and it took so long to get into the city because of the crowd celebrating his entry. He didn't actually make it to his destination, the temple, until nighttime. He entered the temple and surveyed the worship of God's people. He goes back to Bethany. Day two, which is now Monday, Jesus, first thing he does when he enters Jerusalem, he goes back to the temple and he cleanses it. Meaning he grabs a whip and he drives out all those who were sinning in God's house. All those who were money changers, buying and selling animals, all the things that weren't supposed to be done in God's house. Jesus kicked them all out. That's Monday, day two. Day three, Jesus comes back to the newly cleansed temple and has a series of debates with the religious leaders. They start to question him. Who gave you this authority to do this in God's house. But we saw that Jesus is the son of the owner. God owns the temple. He's the son of the owner. And God the Father chose the son to be the licensed contractor to remodel God's house. So he had all authority to do what he did. And then he makes an emphasis about his authority with a parable. That was the parable of the wicked tenants where we spent most of our time last Sunday where Jesus talks about the owner of a vineyard who put a fence around it, dug a wine press, put a tower up, and then he leased 
that land, that vineyard to tenants. They're renting from him. And then the owner went away to another country. While he was away, he sent servants to get fruit from his vineyard. The tenants took the servant, beat him, and sent him back. The owner, perplexed by it, sends another servant. They beat and kill him. He sends another and they beat and they, he keep, they keep doing this to his servants. So then the owner says, I'm going to send my beloved son. Surely they're going to respect him. So he sends his son and Jesus says to all the religious leaders, those wicked tenants took the son, beat him, killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? And Jesus tells them he's going to come and he's going to destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to somebody else. Why is that story significant? Because it's about God the Father sending his prophets to his people, Israel, who were the wicked tenants. They beat and killed the prophets. And then he finally sent his beloved son, Jesus himself, who is telling the story. And Jesus is prophesying that in three days time, those religious leaders will kill him and throw him out of the vineyard of Israel. And that's exactly what ends up happening three days later to fulfill the prophecy. But then we have Wednesday, day four. Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives and he begins speaking to his disciples about the end times, telling them about their own persecution and the things that are going to happen in his name because they believe in Jesus. Then we come to day five, Thursday, and Jesus is starting to reach his finish line. He can see the last turn in the race. And so he tells his disciples to prepare Passover. Because the crucifixion of Jesus took place in the context of the Jewish celebration of Passover. You cannot have one without the other. And so Jesus ends up preparing, having them prepare the Passover meal. And it's then on day five, they, the last supper is celebrated. Jesus' last meal with his disciples. And he foreshadows his crucifixion by saying, the bread, this is my broken body broken for you. The wine, this is my blood shed for you. Take, eat. And he gives them this covenantal meal. He shows that he is the Passover lamb. He is the sacrifice for sin that removes sin once and for all. And then he tells his disciples with great sorrow in his heart that that night all of them will fall away. And during the meal, Judas Iscariot leaves early without anybody really knowing why except for Jesus. And then Jesus, after they sang a hymn, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to wrestle in prayer because he's about to finish the work of redemption the Father sent him to finish. And so he wrestles in prayer and that's where our Savior, he ended up sweating drops of blood because of the anguish of his soul and the reality of the journey he was about to take for you and for me. And while he was there praying and his disciples couldn't even stay awake long enough to pray with him, then Judas and the soldiers come and Jesus, our Savior, is betrayed with a kiss. And that began day six, Jesus' mourning of trials injustice that would be heaped upon him by the Jewish leaders. He had three Jewish trials and three Roman trials. All the Roman ones took place before Pontius Pilate. Now, there's very elements to this Good Friday story in the crucifixion. And I wrestled with which passage I would choose. I was going to go with Mark's gospel. It was the first one written. And it's very powerful, but it's more biographical. Mark focuses on the people, Simon of Cyrene and the criminals crucified with Christ. Joseph of Arimathea who buries him. But John is more theological and John takes the everyday elements and shows us their significance. John tells us about the significance of the cross, the significance of the garments that Jesus wore that the soldiers cast lots for. He tells us about the significance of the sour wine that Christ drank right before he said it is finished. And he tells us about the significance of the blood and water that poured out of Jesus' side when the soldier pierced his heart. We're going to look at the significance of all of those things. So why don't you stand with me in honor of God's word and let's read this historical account 
of what happened to Christ on this day. We're looking at John 19. I want you to understand the context. So we're only going to study from 16 to 37. But I want to read Jesus before Pilate so you understand how he is condemned. John 19 verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes him a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. That's almost 9 a.m. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. First paragraph about the cross. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. You can be seated. We'll pause there. What I have written, I have written. We see in the first verse of 16, it says, So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. These are the Roman soldiers who were doing the dirty work of the Jewish leaders at this time. John's gospel tells us that Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. The Jews rejected him. And the Romans carried out their bidding. But the reality is nobody takes Jesus anywhere unless he allows them. That's the reality. Unless it's Christmas time and we're talking about a nativity scene. (laughs) Because every year some young punks run around stealing baby Jesus from the front lawn of churches all around this great nation. But Jesus himself is not taken anywhere involuntarily. It says that he went as a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Meaning that sheep, they don't utter a word. They just go where they're told. And Jesus went where his father told him to go. And he went without uttering a word of defense to show that nobody takes Jesus anywhere and nobody can take his life unless he allows them. Jesus prophesied in John 10 about his own life. John 10, 18, he says to them, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, referring to the cross, and I have authority to take it up again, referring to the resurrection. 
This charge I have received from my father. Have you ever met somebody who had the power to lay down their life and die and while being dead, then have the power and ability to raise from the dead again? Jesus is the only one who has ever had that power and authority to do so. And we see that Jesus again and again and again foretold his death and resurrection all throughout his earthly ministry. Verse 17, it says that Jesus went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. We don't know the, the exact location where that was, but it was outside the city of Jerusalem on the outskirts. It was most likely near the main road so that every crucified criminal could be made a spectacle of. The Romans used the cross as a deterrent. Do not break our laws or this will happen to you. Every criminal was made a public spectacle and it was the most shameful of all deaths. Now, it's, John says that Jesus went out bearing his own cross, but Mark tells us there was a guy named Simon of Cyrene who carried Jesus' cross. Sounds like a contradiction in the gospel accounts, does it not? Not at all. They both carried the cross at different parts of the journey. It says here that Jesus went out. Went out from where? From Pilate's dwelling, his headquarters, the governor's mansion there in Rome. That's where he stood trial. And he carried the cross from there, went into the streets, the Via de la Rosa, the way of suffering. And while he was going through the streets, then they compelled a passerby named Simon of Cyrene to carry it for Jesus. And there we have embodied in the cross and who carried it exactly what Jesus said we are to do. Mark 8, 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus set the example. He carried his own cross and then God in his sovereignty called another man to carry that same cross behind Jesus and follow his bloody footsteps. And so there you have in that picture, Jesus carried his cross. And it was customary for the criminal to carry the cross because it signified they were guilty. Why did Jesus not carry it the whole way? Because he wasn't guilty. He carried it because he took our guilt upon him. But he was not the guilty party. Who was? People like Simon. People like you and me. We were the guilty ones. And so our sins were placed upon him to fulfill the scriptures that say the iniquity of us all was laid upon him. So he carried our sin. And he was nailed to the cross because of our sin at a place called the skull. Now, there's a little history to the cross. Um, some say that the Phoenicians and others created this form of execution, but the Romans perfected it. And the Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero said this, the cross was the most cruel and shameful of all punishments. He said, let it never come near the body of a Roman citizen. Nay, not even near his thoughts or his eyes or his ears. You weren't even supposed to look at a crucifixion, hear about it, or even think about it if you were a Roman. Because it's never something you were to experience or even watch. Because it was so heinous and despicable. We talk and we sing about being at the foot of the cross. Lead me to the cross. Do you know what was at the foot of a cross? Human waste. Everything that comes out of the human body was pooled up at the foot of the cross. Sweat, blood, water, urine, feces, everything. Because the human body could not contain itself when it endured excruciating pain to that degree and that's where we get that term excruciating because it comes from crucifixion it was absolutely brutal it was a way of bringing somebody to the point of death and not letting them die 
And that is the way God the Father chose his son to die for you and me. He could have chosen a million other ways. But it was the cross that embodied what you and I deserve and what God spared you and I from. The significance of the cross is spoken about in Scripture. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Didn't sin come into the world through a tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve were told one commandment. Don't eat of that one. And God gave them everything else in free reign. And they couldn't keep that one commandment. Screwed it up for all of us. But we would have done the same thing. Because curiosity would have just driven us nuts. And so they ate of it. And from that tree. And so then God planned in redemption. that One day his son would come. And instead of eating of that tree. He would die upon that tree. And erase the sin that was committed by humanity in that garden. And so then, Jesus, we see, is crucified with criminals. They crucified Him, and with Him, two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Most of the Gospel writers just tell us that both criminals mocked Jesus, and they both did. But at one point, during this long time hanging on the cross, one of them repented. One of them said, Jesus, remember me when you come in to your father's kingdom. And he said, surely today you will be with me in paradise. He believed in Jesus while he was suffering for his own sins. But at one time, they both were reviling and rebuking Jesus, saying, you said you could save others. Why don't you save yourself and us? It fulfilled the scriptures again that Jesus was crucified between criminals. But Pilate wrote a placard, an inscription, and put it on the cross. The Jews weren't happy about it, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now we've heard that throughout the gospel stories, all growing up maybe, about this placard. But what's fascinating about it is it's customary to the, for the crime to be written above the criminal. But Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. There was no crime to be written because Jesus, being judged by an impartial party, was found not guilty. So instead, he wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. His title. It was a true statement, but it was also a jab at the Jewish leaders. Pilate wanted them to just go nuts to not like what he did. And he knew that Jesus was innocent, and yet he gave in and had him crucified anyways. And so he wanted those leaders to understand that, it, that his blood was on them. Verse 20. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, one of the main roads. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Three different languages. These placards were not always written in three different languages, but this proves two points. One, Aramaic or Hebrew of the day is the language of religion. Latin is the language of law, and Greek is the language of philosophy, and all those three together are what crucified Jesus. Blinded religious zeal, unwavering laws, and injustice, and distorted philosophy. That's what man does. They put all three of those together and screw it all up. But Jesus is the only one, and he also died for the whole world. They didn't just write it in Hebrew. Every known language of the Roman Empire, because Jesus died for the whole world, not just the Jews. Verse 21, so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. I love that. Not many things exemplary about Pilate, but I like that statement from him. Look at verse 23. We're going to look at Jesus' garments. 
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments, divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture that says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. So the cross was spoken of before Jesus was ever crucified. He foretold his crucifixion and the prophets, Isaiah and David, all spoke of the Messiah being crucified. They described crucifixion in, in vivid detail, which we'll look at some of those verses. But what about Jesus' Jesus's clothing? A criminal was crucified naked. They were stripped bare. Talk about being publicly shamed. And there they hung for hours on end. And here they take his garments and it says that it was divided up between four soldiers. Because at most crucifixions, there was one centurion who was in charge who was given four soldiers to assist him. So Jesus' garments, there were five pieces to his attire. And we'll look at these. He had most likely a turban, something to cover his head, a pair of sandals, an undergarment, which was the seamless robe that they cast lots for. He had an outer garment and a girdle, a, a belt. So four of the pieces, they just, oh, you take the girdle, you take the outer garment, you take his sandals and I'll take his hat. And like, cool, we're all good with that. But what about the seamless robe? Now that tells us that it was more valuable than all the rest. They weren't willing to cut it into four pieces. It was seamless, meaning it took great skill in that day to, come, to weave that type of garment. Most likely it was created by one of the ladies that the Gospels tell us that followed Jesus and his disciples and provided for their every need. And so this was something that every one of them wanted that garment. And so they cast lots for it, and the winner got to keep it. Little did they know that if they'd only believe in Christ, they'd get something much more valuable than a garment. They would be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That rather than their dirty rags of sin, they would have the blameless garments of Christ to cover them so they could walk into the presence of Almighty God and be sinless. They missed it. And yet it was offered to all of them for free. They didn't have to cast lots for it. And yet it fulfilled the scripture. God was working in his plan that the fact that they decided we're going to roll the dice and see who gets this garment was already written about in Psalm 22, verse 16. Listen to this. For dogs encompass me. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. The Romans are Gentiles. They were the dogs according to the Jews. It says the dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Does that not sound like the crucifixion of Christ? That was written about 600 years before it ever happened and before the Romans ever made crucifixion popular? Why would David write something like that? Dogs are surrounding me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. You look at the life of David. His feet and hands were never pierced. It's because he was writing through the power of the Holy Spirit about Jesus and what he would do for us. Verse 17, I count all my bones, meaning none of them were broken. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sounds like a fulfillment of Scripture, does it not? And I said this on Sunday, and I'll say it again now. How can ancient documents foretell future events in exact detail, not once, not twice, but hundreds of times about the same man and there not be a God who's controlling all of it. It is the only way to explain that ancient documents being fulfilled in a present time period historically can happen with such accuracy unless God said, this is how I'm going to do it. And then he did it that way. So, we're going to get to the crowd. And what you need to know about all this crowd that surrounded the cross, there was most likely a lot of people. A huge gathering. Because remember, six days earlier, all Jerusalem was hailing him as the next king. And now they heard he was arrested. That morning they found out. 
around 9 a.m., that he had been sentenced to, be, to, cruci- to crucifixion. And so they wanted to go out and see if it was in fact true. And there, most people picture Jesus really high up in the air. Most crosses, by the time they mounted the cross on the ground, the crucified person was only maybe a foot above the head of the crowd. So you have Jesus, you know, I'm not that tall, so maybe he's, maybe he's a little higher for me. But for you, maybe there, almost eye to eye. And they would come up and they would shout insults at the criminals. They would spit in their face. And many of the crucified would do disgusting things in response to retaliate to those who are mocking them. And yet Jesus did none of those things. You know what he did? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there he was, he's going to be hanging on the cross, naked, but with no shame his own. He bore our shame and our iniquity. And it was at 9 a.m. they crucified him. And he hung on that cross until noontime with the sun shining, but at noon... It says the earth went dark. The sun did not shine because the sun was being punished by the wrath of God. And for three more hours, he hung on that cross, body shaking and convulsing, having to push up every time to take a breath. By that time, he had lost so much blood from the flogging, so much liquid from his body that his dehydration was to the point of killing him alone. So dry he couldn't speak. And there Jesus hung on the cross for six hours for you and me. John talks about the crowd, a little bit about the soldiers, and then the women and John the beloved who is there around the cross. No other disciple was there but John. Look at John 19, 28. This is John's account, by the way. So out of all the disciples and all the accounts, John was there seeing all this happening. All the others had fallen away and not returned. John fell away and returned quickly. Look at John 19, starting at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At 3 p.m. is the time, according to Mark. Now, this fulfillment of Scripture is seen in Psalm 69 and Psalm 22. Please turn there with me because they're very powerful to read. Remember, these were written about six centuries before Christ ever came. Psalm 69, 19. David, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was writing from Jesus' perspective on the cross. It is as if Jesus himself uttered these words. David writes, You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broke my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus just said, I thirst. In verse 29, a jar full of sour wine stood there. Do you see the fulfillment? John mentions it. For a reason. Psalm 22, the same psalm that begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the same psalm that Matthew, Mark, and Luke quote in the Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus was calling our attention to this prophecy of him being forsaken so that you and I can be remembered by God the Father. Jesus was cut off so we could be grafted in. And so here you see the sour wine being given. Psalm twenty-two, fourteen: I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. The crucified would often, their shoulders would dislocate because of the strain upon their rotator cuff, 
and their muscles that hold the shoulder together, they would have torn and dislocated, making breathing even more difficult because they had to push up on their nail-pierced feet in order to take every breath. So every breath was shallow because the lung cavity would collapse with each descent. So now he says that my heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Jesus, his thirst cannot be over exaggerated. And so he said, I thirst. And they took a hyssop branch with a sponge on it and dipped it in sour wine. This is the second time Jesus was offered something to drink. Do you remember the first time? John doesn't talk about it. The other gospel writers tell us that Jesus was offered wine mixed with gall or myrrh. And that was an ancient pain reliever. In order that those being crucified could have a little pain relief so they could make it to the cross and then experience all the pain. Jesus did not dull his senses one iota for you and me. He rejected that drink, but this one he accepted to fulfill the scriptures that they gave me sour wine to drink. And sour wine was the cheap wine given to the soldiers. It wasn't even the good chuck, good stuff. It was the two buck chuck <laughs> of that day. And it was sour and it was nasty. But they wet his lips. He took a little bit so that he could actually utter his final words upon this earth. It is finished. But do you know what they used to give him this drink? A hyssop branch. So what? Do you think John tells us a hyssop branch for a reason? Yes. Because this is Passover. And in the original Passover, God told the Israelites when they fled Egypt to kill a lamb, to take a hyssop branch, dip it in the blood of that lamb and put it and smear it upon the doorposts of everybody's house. And that everybody who had the blood of the sacrificial lamb on their house, the angel of death would pass over and the firstborn in that house would not be killed. So Jesus is the fulfillment. He is that perfect Passover lamb. And they took a hyssop branch in wine to point to it to say that it is the blood of Christ upon the doorposts of your heart and mine that cleanses us and causes us to not die, but to live forever. To have our sins removed once and for all, to be led out of slavery, not to Egypt, but to be led out of slavery from sin to new life in the promised land of the kingdom of God. Is that not amazing? Is that not an amazing story? I mean, God knows how to put a story together, does he not? To see all this stuff written thousands and hundreds of years before all come together in this most important moment in all of human history. Nothing is mentioned without significance in the gospel narrative. And so we see when Jesus received the sour wine, he uttered those words. Where are we at? Good grief. We jumped back and forth and back again. Did I just forget to push the button? It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And we know from other gospel accounts, you remember what happened when he gave up his spirit? The veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That veil could not be torn easily. It was up to, I believe, six inches thick. And it ripped from top to bottom. That was the separation of the Holy of Holies. Man could not enter past that veil. And yet Jesus ripped it in half. So that we now have access to a holy God because of the holy sacrifice of Christ. And the earth shook. And all knew that Jesus was the Son of God when he died and gave up his spirit. So now the religious leaders come and they wanted to speed up the death. They didn't know Jesus was dead yet. So since it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross during the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So if they break the femurs, the crucified criminals can no longer breathe. 
They can't lift up and breathe, so they end up dying of asphyxiation or suffocation. So they go to break the legs. They break one criminal's legs. They break the other with a big mallet. They go to Jesus. He's already dead. They want to make sure he's dead. So the soldiers came, broke the legs, the first and the second. They come to Jesus. He's already dead. So they don't break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. Now, certain people who like to explain away the miracle of what Christ did will say, oh no, it's called the swoon theory. Jesus fainted, which many people did because of the extreme pain. And then when they took him down off the cross and they put him in the cold tomb, he was revived. And so he went on to live out his days somewhere in solitude. Um, the whole point of the gospel narratives is proving that there is no possible way Jesus did not die. And so they pierced his side up through the rib cage into his heart, pulled it out and blood and water flowed. So here's the elements of the crucifixion, the blood and water. Why is that significant? It's, it's significant for a reason, right? Can we agree? Blood didn't just come out. That would have been normal. Blood and water came out. Medically speaking, one theory is that Jesus died of a massive myocardial infarction in which the heart ruptured, where Jesus literally died from a broken heart that exploded in his chest. And that causes the elements in the blood and the body to mix. And so blood and water flowed out. But symbolically, what's the purpose of blood? It is the life of a being and his life flowed out of his side. Where did God take Eve from Adam? From his side. Where do you think God creates a new humanity? From the side of Christ. From his blood and water that flowed out of his body. The blood that forgives sin and the waters of baptism that apply the work of Christ to the sinner that they might become a new creation, a new humanity in Jesus. Blood and water. That you can be forgiven of all your sins signified in the blood and you can be given a new life signified by the waters that flowed from him. Jesus literally became the fountain of eternal life through his blood and water that flowed from his side. I love John's explanation, verse 35. John says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. John wrote all this down so you would believe as if you were there like he was. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Had they broken his legs like they did to the other criminals, it would have been a false prophecy. And yet they did not break his legs. And it goes on and says, and again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Not only did they pierce his hands and his feet, but his side. Ladies and gentlemen, in wrapping this up, I want to ask you a question. How long did Jesus hang on the cross? From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Six hours. Was Jesus. The sixth day of the week, Friday. Six hours on the sixth day. Why? Six is the number of man. God created man on the sixth day, did he not? And man fell into sin. And God all along planned to create a new humanity. We see that with Noah. God judges the earth with a flood, and he takes Noah and his family and creates a new humanity, but they're still lost in sin. God then calls Abraham out of the nations to be a new humanity through his offspring. To make a nation of them. But they were still lost in sin and did not obey his commandments. So then he sends his only begotten son. That out of his pierced side would come a new creation. A new humanity. New people. 
born again, new life. And what you and I experience oftentimes is not even touching upon the life Jesus has won for you and me. We are so deceived and lost by the life the world promotes that we think that is where it is at. And yet Jesus is saying, I'm where it's at. I gave my life so you could have a new life. You would be a new humanity, not a nation, but a kingdom of holy priests and people set aside for my purposes, not for your own, to have forgiveness of sins through my blood and a new life through baptism in my name. That's why we celebrate what Christ did on Good Friday, the greatest evil humanity has ever committed, the killing and murder of God's only son became the greatest thing that has ever happened for you and me. But it is only great and it is only good for people who believe in Jesus and what he has done. And so we are going to sing this song that's called The Cross Has the Final Word. And because in light of what Jesus has done, I'm willing to bet that you understand some things more than you did before you came tonight because of God's word and what it says. And I hope there's new aspects to the cross that have pierced your own heart and that you are changed tonight and Sunday morning. That God begins to change you from the inside that you might be and experience what new humanity in Christ actually is. There's something we do here on Good Friday and how we end out our service. And first of all, I want to speak to those who maybe they've never come to the cross. They've never laid down their life. They've never professed faith in Jesus. We have a really cool cross over here in the courtyard that a good friend made because God told him to make it. And it's there. And what we do is anybody who has never given their life to Christ because Christ died on that cross and was nailed to it for you. You have an opportunity to write your name on a piece of paper and nail it to that cross. Identifying that you have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. So that's to the person who's never received Christ. But maybe you're somebody who there's sins that have plagued you your whole life. Or maybe recently in your life. And you want to be done messing around with those things. You want to give them to Jesus who died for those sins, who forgives those sins. Write them down. Fold it up and nail it to that cross and leave it there. Don't pick it up again. And leave it there. Maybe there's things that you're scared of, that you worry about, and you're obsessing over them and you need to let go. Write it down and nail it to the cross. The band's going to play us out. Please continue to, there's uh, kind of some, you can form a line for anybody who's going to do that. If not, there's fellowship halls open and fellowship and whatever, but that's going to still be a special solemn time for those who are going to the cross this evening. Um, So let's be respectful of that, but then have fun celebrating what God is doing in our life. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray. You can go out these doors. The band's going to play the song. Um, But if that's you, there's pieces of paper, pens on one table, and then there's nails and hammers on the other. Father, we thank you for tonight and the practical opportunity, Lord, to visibly see our name or our sins nailed to a cross. And we thank you, Lord, that it is a symbolic act of a spiritual reality. And I pray, Lord, for any of those, Lord, who are feeling your Holy Spirit tugging upon their heart, Lord, may they have the bravery to identify with Christ and be crucified with you. And Lord, for those who are struggling in sin, set them free from it. We're told in Romans that you became a curse for us, that we, could, that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. May we be set free tonight from any sins that plague us. Thank you for the new life we have as your new people 
And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Do not miss Sunday morning.